What is up, everybody? Hope you guys had a wonderful weekend and a good start to the week. Lord knows I did, as compared to last week. Last week was a shit show for me. Started all my videos late, and I'm starting this one late. God damn it, I didn't even realize it was already this late. Son of a bitch. Sorry for the cursing, I'm just... Yeah, pissed off that I wasted some valuable time last week on a company that, I mean, I, I can't even, I don't know if you guys heard my, my last few rants about how terrible I think uh, Best Buy in Jefferson County, Lakewood, Belmar, Colorado is. <laughs> I make sure to name that because every Best Buy I go to and I, I mention that, they just laugh because they have heard the same stories. But my dislike overall for Jefferson County and how terrible their police officers are and racist and they're just a punk asses. Yeah, they're, they're pretty bad. And this company that I... Uh, was working with last week kind of takes the cake. Um, some, uh, I get, I don't know what, uh, maybe 60 year olds with the 30 year old friend acting like a bunch of idiots dressing up for <laughs> Halloween and being extremely inappropriate. Like, Oh, if I take off my jacket, I think my boobs are going to show. I'm like, yo, like, do you know what, like, you know, sexual harassment, like, you know, in the workplaces or whatever? Yeah, like, I, you know, I'm not going to complain or anything, but I don't really want to see your, like, nasty boobs. And then I have this, uh, yeah, old-ass woman who... Oh yeah, I, I I I really like you know what you're doing and what you're bringing to the table, and then oh I'm weary. I think dementia's starting to set in for this bitch because she's she's not all there obviously, and you know it's it's not defamation of character because I haven't even named the company yet, but I think I might be here pretty soon because they done pissed me off. <laughs> Just like this next story is going to piss you guys off, but even more so because this next one, it took me four tries, four tries to record this. And those four tries, I mean, I, my eyes watered up and, um, what this, like without giving away too much, what this person went through. It's something I've never heard of before. And to say that it wasn't a miracle, if if you wouldn't consider this a miracle, I, I don't know what is. Um, I just, yeah, was completely touched by this. You know, yesterday I, I, I let out, like, you know, a funny skit just because I needed to, like, kind of, like, clear my palate, if that makes sense, after you know, trying to record it so many times and getting so emotional. And then the week that I had, you know, with this awful company and it, it wasn't the, it wasn't everybody. It was like maybe three people, mainly two, but you know, a batch of two to three apples, you know, and a set of good, you know, apples can fuck up a lot of stuff. And for them to be so disorganized, so, I mean, the girl couldn't even read what she's inputting. I'm like, how is it that I know more about this stuff than you do when... It was just, it was hilarious to me. 
but I met some really, really nice people there that I hope make it a, f you know, I hope make it a far way in their industry, man. They, they really, you could tell like the real humble and contrite from, you know, the real office drama type bitches. And that's exactly what I was working under, you know, well, not under, thank goodness. That's what I was working around. We're the ones who love to fucking spread drama, the ones who love drama, the ones who thrive off of drama. And when you try to diffuse the situation, it's taken out of context. And I was like, I cannot handle this. From this point on, I don't give a fuck what you guys think of me anymore. You know, fuck y'all. I'm, you know, what does Eric Carmen say? Screw you guys, I'm going home. <laughs> you know. But it still pissed me off nonetheless. And then when I was trying to do the story, it just pissed me off even more because I'm compounding it with this. And so without me further bitching about, you know, my my last week, which was hell. And, you know, you learn your lesson when you do something that is just stupid. You learn your lesson. You move on. Don't do that again. Be leery of certain people that you think, is this fucker fake? And usually I'm good at reading fake people. But, you know, when a, when a 70-year-old is dressing like a 30-year-old, kind of makes you wonder, like, is she all there? Like, you know, it's like Alzheimer's or dementia setting in because, you know, my grandma had that and, like, you know, I don't know very many people in their right mind are going to dress up like a 30 year old when you're like, you know, 70 or so. But anyways, you guys are going to flip out on this story. So, uh, try to hang in there, man, and grab a box of tissues if you have them, because this is, yeah, it's hard. Um, so without further ado, here we go. So none other then our sheriff, Grady Judd. And it's sad that I know the Polk County, Florida sheriff's name. And I don't even know the sheriff's name of Colorado. Well, of uh, the very territorial Jefferson County, Colorado. And for Denver, Colorado. I don't know ni neither one of the sheriff's names. Um... I'm sure you guys know why they're, what the difference is between the sheriffs and the cops. But it just molded into one. So, I mean, it doesn't even matter anymore. Um, but, yeah. Just, um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with me today as we give you what we anticipate will be the last update about our mass murder that occurred on Sunday. The, before I start, there's been a lot of interest in wanting to help the family, and quite frankly, the family needs help. As you know, an, an entire family was wiped out at one time, and we've got an 11-year-old that's at Tampa General, so we have hospital bills, and everything that's related to that, as well as funeral bills, as well as two homes that have been destroyed. And to quote one of the uncles that's working closely with a family, I never had a class in high school to help me deal with this. As you can well imagine that we have our crime victim teams working with the family and there are four uh, sites that have been set up, GoFundMe sites. One of those is a suspicious site. We are determining whether or not it's valid at this time and GoFundMe is a business so they have to have a percentage of the money in order to function and operate. Mm -hmm. If a lot of people will donate a little money and they'll send it to Polk Sheriff Charities, 100% of that donation, there is no administrative fee, 100% of that donation 
will go to the family. And when you hit the site, when you search up Polk Sheriff Charity, it'll also give you a drop-down box that will say quadruple homicide. However, any donations that come in will go, if you happen to drop it in the wrong box or put it in a general box, all of those donations will go to the family. So 100%. So before I start and get... I really wish... I don't wish that this happened, but of course I wish I knew about this uh, sooner. Give you the update. I wanted to make sure that, that I did that because once again, we have a family that is going through a horror right now that no one should ever have to go through. Just an FYI, it's the video feed that's coming through that uh, is making it grainy like that, where it kind of comes in and out of focus, so I apologize about that. Um, that's on their end, not on here. Not on my end, I should say. I'm sorry. But I wanted to update you, as I told you that I would. The big question has been, what's the nexus? How did... This evil person by the name of Riley find these victims. And we think we have the solution to that. It hasn't changed in that there was no relationship between our victims and Riley. There was no relationship. Brian didn't know them in advance. But here's what happened. We found a witness who lives in the area of North Socom Loop Road, and he said that he was talking to Brian Riley, he knows him, and Riley told him, hey, I'm going to go out with the Hurricane Ida relief assistance, and I offered to make him up a first aid kit. And he, we were working together, and he said, great, now, I said, come by the house and I'll give you the first aid kit. Well, we can document that mass murderer Riley was at his friend's house picking up the first aid kit at about 6.45 p.m. on Saturday. We can also document that he left there about 7.10 p.m. So about 25 minutes later, he left the friend's house. Just after 7.10 p.m., understanding that we got the call of a suspicious person and vehicle at 7.22, sometime in that period, that's when Brian Riley stopped out in front and talked to Justice, who was mowing his yard, one of our homicide victims. And that's when he said, hey, God said that I need to talk to Amber because she's going to commit suicide. And Justice said, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no one here by the name of Amber. But old murderer Riley pressed on. No, I'm not leaving until I talk to Amber. And the guy says, hey, dude, we don't know any Amber. So in the meantime, the mother-in-law is called out and said, who is also a homicide victim, and says, look, mister, we don't know who you are, but we can assure you there's no Amber here. Now, during this period of time where justice is mowing the yard, and our murder suspect stops. We also know by an interview with the 11 year old little girl who's a victim at Tampa General, she was in the yard with her dad. Gosh, and you know so exactly what that our did. murder suspect, Brian Riley, had the opportunity to see a little girl in the yard. So Justice left mad, I'm sorry, Justice told him to leave. The mother-in-law said, 
you need to leave right now. We're going to call the cops. They notified law enforcement. He drove off. Mad, as we found out later. Never did Brian Riley make a threat. Never. He just wanted to talk to Amber because he thought she was going to commit suicide. Just a bizarre, irrational statement, but no threats of violence. You know, I joked about it the other day that I made a video, but the more and more I thought about it, the more and more I realized, and especially after hearing something like this, there are this definitely how unstable people are. I was going, uh, coming back from Best Buy, and, um, you know, you have some parking lots to where you turn in and they make you park a certain way. Uh, so it's basically like, even though they don't have it marked, it's basically like, you know, a one way type of, uh, you know, drive up to park. And, uh, this one, it happened to be, you know, just, you could pull straight in. It wasn't, you know, one way, it was a two way, but it was extremely narrow. So there's a four way stop. There's a car in front of me. And I see that there's a car turning. Like I said, it's always Subarus, man. It's always Subarus. But the car in front of me goes. I see the other right away. And the car on the right is turning. And I'm backed up to give this dude some room. I'm being cognizant of this. Just being polite. Like, I was, you know, kind of in my zone on Friday. I was like, yeah, you know, whatever. You know, I'm not in a rush to do anything. So... I'm giving this dude some room, you know, to pull on in. He has his window up. I have my window down. It was a nice day. And I could see him looking at me, like, waving his hands, like... And I'm like... I just gave this motherfucker all this room to pull in. And he's going off on me. So I did something out of the ordinary. It is true that I'm not confrontational at all. But I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go out I'm gonna go tell this motherfucker something. So I did a EOE. I went down the other lane because I didn't want to get behind him. But and I have a dash cam and everything. So, you know, I could document whatever goes on. To show, you know, like, hey, I'm not trying to assault anybody. And, you know, of course, it records. It does everything like everybody else's dash cams do. And I'm, uh, you know, there, there's cars parked right there in between us. I'm like, dude, what the hell is your problem? I'm like, I just stopped right there so you could get through. F you, you mother effer. You're just goddamn staying right there. You ain't doing shit, but... Freaking block in the way. I'm like, how am I blocking the way when I just gave you the right? I'm like, I had the right of way and I just allowed you to come through so you could have some room. What the hell are you talking about? And I mean, I kid you not. The dude was turning about as red as, you know, these two flags right here. I mean, just red and yelling at the top of his lungs. And I'm just like more or less antagonizing him by laughing. And I'm like, I'm like, damn, bro. I'm like, like, you know, I start just like tagging his personal life and all that shit. And, you know, just being an asshole. And he's like, you know, if you six, shove this up your ass. And I'm like, you know what? I'm sorry, sir, but I don't, I don't, I don't do that from other guys. And I said, uh, I don't have nothing wrong with your lifestyle, but, you know, I happen to, you know, like women. And that just you know, put him over the edge and he was causing a massive scene. And so I was like, you know what? You don't know. Number one, what this guy is going through mentally. You don't know what he's going through at home. You don't know. God forbid if he lost like a child or something like, you know, you don't know what people are going through. And when it kind of hit me, I was like, this is why I don't antagonize people. Because you never know what they're capable of. 
And this is a good example. Now we know, as I give you a compilation of, of interviews, that when our suspect Riley left, he was very angry. And he was very angry at justice because he thought justice had kept him from seeing this child, Amber, that was going to commit suicide. And that's when Brian Riley, our suspect, our murder suspect, said, God told me to kill everyone and to rescue Amber because she's a victim of sex trafficking. So he goes home. He decides to put an ops plan together. In his confession, he says, well, you know what that means? It means you have to kill everyone. And Idiot. He doesn't even... I told you the other day how he arrived at home. He argued with his girlfriend of four years, but never mentioned violence. The girlfriend said, God doesn't talk to you in this way. He accused her of being a non-believer. He got angry. He went to his room. She went to bed. I explained that to you. And she woke up at 6.30 and he was gone. In the neighborhood, we have found a piece of video where at 1 o'clock in the morning, he left his residence in that truck that we found at the scene, the black Ford pickup truck, F-150, with a large, carrying a large shoulder bag, if you will, about one in the morning. So we wondered, where has he been between one in the morning and 422 in the morning? Well, here's a rendition, once again, of information that we were told based upon a, the interview with Brian Riley. He told us that when he left the residence, he went back to North Sopram Loop Road and he did reconnaissance. And I'm going to use terminology that he used. And the terminology that he used is from some of his training, some of his executive training, some of his security training. He said, I went back to do security, not military security training. The dude is probably like many of the shit cops nowadays, because I do call them Call of Duty cops. They're the ones who grew up playing Call of Duty, freaking blasting their way through everything. And it says in almost every state legislation handbook of every law that the last thing a cop should ever do is pull out their service weapon. And what's the first thing you always see? Their service weapon out. Call of Duty cops. And this is the same thing these security guards are learning. Do reconnaissance outside of the house in the moonlight. And he says, and that was the, and, and that was, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if he said that, but that was the beginning of his execution plan. He so told us, and I'm going to read some snippets here, that he repositioned his truck three times so that he would have a fast departure. He searched through and spent time at the house to locate three entrance points into the homes. He planned out his diversions and he prepared his exit strategy. He slashed the tires on both a sedan and the pickup truck he ultimately set on fire. He set out the glow sticks from the road God. next to his vehicle through the backyard 
close to the next house. He explained that those were so he could find his way out in an emergency at night, and so if he found Amber, she could find her way to escape from this house oh my God. where she was a sex crime victim. This is all fiction, all made up by him. Understand, and I underscore, when we make those references, there was no victims of sex crime in that house. He doused the vehicles on, on with gasoline, both the sedan and the truck. He set the truck on fire as a diversion. He said, by the time I got back to the car, it wouldn't catch on fire, but the mission was underway, and I had to push through. He took his breaching tools and he took them around back to the grandmother's apartment and he tried the breaching tools without success on the door. Go figure. So he left that door after shooting through the door and he went around to the south side of the apartment and he shot through the window and he entered. He called it clearing the house. I cleared the house and that's when he killed the grandmother as he was clearing the house. He was clearing the house and looking for Amber. He said I dumped a mag And what he meant was he shot a whole magazine toward the victim God damn it. and getting into the house. He said, then I had to immediately reset. And, and this, once again, more, more tactical terms. I had to reset to start my methodical search for Amber in the main house. He entered the main house by shooting out or breaking out the back, back glass door. He said, I know I made a lot of noise, so I had to push through. I knew that, that they were now aware I was there. He says, I moved down into the fatal funnel, which was not just a fatal funnel, but it was also the hallway through the house. He said, but God told me I was protected. He said, I moved into the bedroom where I shot the dog two times. Mm -hmm. And they asked him, was the dog aggressive? And he said, no, it was very passive. Fucker. The dog showed, created no resistance at all. He said, then I cleared the hallway. And then I went to the bathroom and I shot through the bathroom door and I tried to push in. And they pushed back and I shot through the door some more. I then entered the bathroom where he shot and killed Justice. Justice was trying to keep him out. That was the resistance he was seeing on the other side. Once he killed Justice, he shot the... the 33-year-old significant other or of justice and the three-month-old baby killing them. But everyone was in the bathroom huddling and hiding. That's when he grabbed the 11-year-old victim, took her from the bedroom, I'm sorry, from the bathroom into the living room. And he asked her, where's Amber? He said, she said, I'm not Amber. There is no Amber. And he said, I want to know who Amber is. And he counted down. Three, two, one. Pow. And he shot her. In the thigh area. In the stomach. And she said, and I grabbed the wound. And he asked me again, and shot me again. 
Then this evil human being told us, I tortured her in order to investigate and, and find, in order to find Amber. This is the big bad dude that tortured an 11 year old child. You know what, the common misconception, just because you're all roided up and big like that, doesn't make you a badass. I learned that real quick when I was in boxing. You know, you just look big and intimidating. Now, there's some guys who are big. I had a friend who recently passed away. You know, rest in peace, Tim. But uh, he was like 286, like 3%, 4% body fat, if that. He was an all-state wrestler. And, um, you know, yeah, he was one big dude he didn't want to mess with, but even he said it himself, like 90% of them just are, you know, just trying to look big, you know, getting roided up, trying to look big, trying to just to intim intimidate people until they run across the wrong dude. and murdered a three-month-old baby. Mm -hmm. And the three-month-old baby's mother and father. I hope, ooh. And then, then this guy says to the 11-year-old, do you know why I killed your parents? They're sex traffickers. <laughs> and then he said next, I shot her in the legs. And then when she wouldn't tell me where Amber was, I eliminated her. He thought he'd killed her. But this 11-year-old was very brave and very smart. And she outthought him, thank God. She said, I played dead and I prayed. You know, there's uh, there's a few times I get religious on here, and I don't mean to offend everyone, not everyone, excuse me, anyone, because I know we live in that day and age where, you know, one, one wrong word, one wrong, you know, opinion could really just turn a, a slew of people against you. And I'm certainly, you know, uh, not doing my best. I'm just being me. You know, I, I don't intend to purposely, you know, troll people or, or be an asshole. Um, but, you know, I told you I grew up non-denominational Christian. I went to a private Christian school. We had chapel services at school on Wednesdays in the auditorium. We had mandatory Bible classes that we needed uh, to complete in order to graduate. And these weren't just like your... You know, for those of you who went to Sunday school, I mean, these weren't just your Sunday school Bible classes. These were like, you know, a hardcore, you know, studying, <laughs> you know, who put the Bible together? Why was the Bible put together? Who started the movement of Christianity? Like, you know, what did it replace? Why did it catch on so quickly? You know... In many of those, you know, a lot of people don't know. Some do know, you know, uh, Constantine um, during battle said he looked up in the sky and saw a cross. Well, a lot of conspiracy, you know, conspiracy theorists will be like, well, what does the cross look like, you know, in the sky? It looks like an airplane. Well, there was no airplanes flying back then. All of a sudden he, you know, comes up with this new religion, Christianity. Catholicism and has all the pagan, you know, gods, you know, you know, how they rolled with fear and anybody caught, you know, worshiping them, you know, were like, how can you tell a, a, a generation of people who have been raised on, you know, a certain type of God 
and then all of a sudden telling them that they're wrong. And then forcing scientists, you know, to go underground because science was a form of, you know, the devil. But yet, if it afforded, you know, the Roman emperors some type of, you know, upper hand in any way. Oh, they, they were they were free to go, you know, Michelangelo. Excuse me, um, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, scientists like that. But then you get, you know, the Illuminati. And I don't know the stretch of the Illuminati or the Freemasons to this day. I don't, I don't, that's really neither here nor there. But like, you know, I always say, and, and how, how it's progressed over the years. Because when were the Dead Sea Scrolls found? I mean, I know in the 18th, 19th, 20th century, somewhere around there. I know it wasn't, you know, too, too long ago. You know, added to the Bible, uh, to the New Testament. And, you know, it's just, it was men who put together what they had already collected from these stories about God. They just never put it into effect until Constantine wanted it in effect. And... The only time that I ever questioned my faith, and I don't mean to go off on a long tangent here, but the only time I question my faith is besides Gobekli Tepli, which is so far to date the absolute oldest man made structures in the world. They predate the pyramids. They predate everything else by, I'm not kidding. I could be off here, but probably 30, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 years they predate this. And the very first culture to have ever established writing who had ever established, you know, trading goods for other goods, to ever basically begin what would be the blueprint for every civilization following the Mesopotamians, they were the first culture that they have found writing. They haven't found anything at Gobekli Tepe, Temple, and I know I'm I'm pronouncing the last part of that wrong. It's, it's either Tepe, Temple. <laughs> it's one of those, but they haven't found any writings or anything there yet. They just excavated the site of these very, very old fittings of how in the hell did they cut this rock down to fit like this? They don't get it. Same thing in Peru, same thing in the month, you know, like, how did they move these? How do they cut these so goddamn precise? Nobody knows. And then the writing of the Mesopotamians, which is modern day Iraq, was on Kanegaka form tablets, which is like fucking granite. And these huge things of granite, like, that are still readable to this day. I mean, yeah, there's, you know, cracks along the granite and all that. It's amazing that, you know, their words last longer than the granite. But, I mean, they basically describe the same thing the Old Testament does. They describe a world flood. They describe their gods as being, you know, taller than men, um, living for, um, being told that they've, they could live for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, that they were worshipped. And I know Eric Von Donneken believed that they were uh, here on a mission to retrieve gold 
because that's what they needed to survive on their home planet, which I think was bullshit. But a lot of what the Old Testament talks about is what the Mesopotamians talk about. And so what it comes down to is having faith. And what he just said is, you know, this is a miracle from God. Whatever your faith lies in, I'm not going to let that detract because it doesn't mean that those stories didn't originate still from the Bible that I read and studied, you know, while I was in school. And for that little girl and a little 11 year old to have been shot that many times to have laid there and played dead while this fucker tortures her. You know, is a miracle. And I know some might say, well, why didn't God protect her? That's a good question, and that's a question I don't have the answers for. I would ask the same thing. God, why didn't you protect her and her family? Why did you let this maniac do this to her and her family? Well, there's sin in this world, and there's evil in this world, and this fucker is just a good example of that. And you know what? There's a special place in hell for pieces of shit like him. And that's the reason she's alive today. Before he shot her, thinking he'd kill her whenever she played dead, the suspect told us, I asked God, if a 12-year-old could be involved in sex trafficking, and God told me yes, and that's when I killed her. I wonder what he After said. After that, he said he, she wasn't dead. Was when he had the shootout, the first shootout, and that one was with Lieutenant Tompkins, who came in the back door. And then he had more shootouts with our deputies as they arrived. We believe at this point in the investigation, and as I told you before, anything I tell you is subject to change by the time we finish the investigation, but this is the best information we have at this moment in time. We believe that during the subsequent shootout, is when one of the deputies who was shooting one of our rifles shot him through the stomach. It was a side-to-side -side wound. It actually went through his, through the vest he was wearing, and but it did not enter the cavity. It just went through the exterior portion of his stomach and through the fat area. He immediately retreated back of all places to the baby's nursery where, where you would think everyone would be safe and secure. And he started putting quick clot or material to stop the bleeding. After he did that, he told us, he said, well, I knew at that point I was outgunned and outmanned, so I dumped my bulletproof vest in my guns, and I walked outside with my hands up and gave up. Fucking coward. That's right. He didn't want to die. He didn't want to die. He consciously and intentionally decided, well, heck. They're all here now. They've engaged me once at the back door. They've shot me through the window. I better give up. He was a coward. An absolute coward. He looks like a man, but he's not a man. He's a sniveling coward. He was a big bad dude when he had two different firearms and broke into a grandmother's home and shot and murdered an unarmed grandmother. He was a bad dude, 
when armed with three firearms, Jesus. went into this house and shot and killed a three-month-old baby in the arms of its mother and executed the mother with multiple gunshots. How would you feel being the examiner, being the, you know, the photo forensic examiner having to take those pictures? I mean, I, I, you know, like they say, you know, there's, there's something new every day that we learn at work or whatever. But, I mean... God forbid that I'm even rehashing some of these stories, but the sick fucking mom that put her baby in the microwave. I mean, how do you not need therapy for some shit like that? And the sad thing about their hiring system, from what I've known and from what I heard from my former best friend's dad, is that you know, a lot of these detectives, too. I mean, you know, if you look at it, lawyers have the highest suicide rate, followed by doctors, and then followed by uh, detectives or policemen, because all of their, all of their professions want them sound of mind, but yet they don't take into account the shit that they see, the shit that they deal with on a daily basis, and how they're only human and it could negatively affect their mental state. But if they go and report that, Hey, your lawyer just saw, you know, a, a mental therapist. It's like, Oh, well, you know, he's, he's off his rocker. You know, I'm definitely not going with him. It's going to negatively affect his business. Same. I know it's a lot different with, with, uh, with doctors that doctors, if they report, Having to go see, you know, uh, you know, one of their colleagues that's a mental therapist, that's like really not good for them. And they, you know, it, it gets put on their record, you know, if they're fit for, um, not fit for duty necessarily, but there's this, it, it's like a beautiful but sad picture that this paramedic took, uh, this paramedic and his team they rushed a 19 year old girl who uh was ODing and um he's a young doctor I would say I mean you really can't you really can't tell but if you ever look up like historic photos or uh touching photos um it'll give you a caption of what the photo is about and this one was recent, like fell relatively recent, like within the past 20, 30 years. And the doctor in the emergency room, he had to have been like maybe around 30 or so. And he lost a little girl and he took off all his, you know, protective gear, you know, his gloves, his face mask and all that. And just walked outside. Didn't say a thing to anybody. And the paramedic said, you know, he saw the look on his face and the doctor walked about maybe 40, 50 feet away from the building, from the front entrance of the emergency room and just got like in a catcher's position and just was bawling his eyes out. And the paramedic caught this beautiful picture of how much it meant to this man, to this doctor, to save this girl. And he needed five minutes to regroup. And after the paramedic, you know, caught the picture, he turned away and acted like, you know, he didn't see anything. And uh, the doctor just came back in and... Uh, you know, he's like, what do we have next? And, um, yeah. And then the detectives. You know, seeing the shit that they do. Again, that goes on their record. Are they fit for duty? Can they handle this kind of, uh, you know, can they handle these crime scenes that you're going to be seeing that are just the depravity 
and the worst of men. I've had two friends, one girlfriend, in murder-suicide situations. A girlfriend where her father fucking killed her mother and then killed himself when she was visiting her grandparents in Dallas. A girl that I had the biggest crush on. I actually used to go to church and pray, you know, Lord, let her see in me what I see in her. But, you know, I was in the friend zone. It was fine. But my God, what her family went through. I still prayed for them to this day. I couldn't imagine. I wish that the God that I have faith and trust in didn't allow things like this to happen, but when it does, all it can do is just pray for those that are left and ask that they find peace and solace. When he killed and executed the father with multiple gunshots, he was a big bad dude when he took an 11-year-old child and shot her while trying to interrogate her to find Amber. He was a big, bad guy. But then when he got shot by the good guys, he falls up. <laughs> he drops his vest and his guns. He wants, when he exits the house, to make sure that we all know he's not armed. And our deputies did exactly as they should have. They took him into custody we got him emergency medical help. Then he got to the hospital and tried to take one of the Lakeland police officers' guns. And they had to fight with him at the hospital. And then he confessed. He confessed to the horrible tragedy that he did on a Sunday morning. Wow. Here's what we know at this point in the investigation. Now understand, crime scene is still working. Will not be finished today, probably tomorrow, maybe through the rest of the week. This is the most extensive single crime scene that we have worked that I can remember. It appears at this point, the investigation, five deputies shot that morning in response to this mass murder and one Lakeland police officer. We shot approximately 59 times. We know that our mass murderer shot in excess of 100 times Jesus this particular morning. We know based upon what we've found so far, we're starting to do background work by some of the detectives, that our suspect, as you already know, had four years in the Marines, three years in the reserves, a trip to Afghanistan and Iraq. He worked in executive and private security and was well thought of and was well trained. He has 16 separate certificates in security and tactical training. He was well trained. You know, that thought always crossed my mind working at the VA Medical Center. I think that's why they employed police, like on site. I mean, the police were very well armed, very well protected, um, and always, always a presence. And it always crossed my mind because of how shitty they treated the vets and I fucking hated it. I hated it so bad. I wish that I had, you know, authority to do something about it. But 99% of the vets I met were just, they were awesome. They were just the coolest people I could ever meet and talk to. And... The thought crossed my mind, though, of 
you know, what if one of these days one of them just lose it from how badly they're being treated here? Comes in, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of vets out there that love guns. And what if they just come through here and, you know, being in the ba basement where, you know, a couple hundred yards away from me is the cafeteria and the, uh, what do you call it, the store where you could buy like freaking anything you want, microwaves, TVs, freaking PlayStations, you name it, all tax-free. And you don't have to be a vet to do that either. I, that's that's not really a secret, so I'm not like giving away big secrets here. But if any of you guys ever want to buy something, you know, go to a VA, and anything you buy is tax-free. So um, you heard it here. But, like I said, it's not a big secret. Um, and it always made me wonder, what, what is it going to take till one day that I see this happen? And the craziest thing that i ever seen happen was one of the, the Brinks trucks came in, changed the money out on the ATM machine. I happened to be in the cafeteria grabbing me, you know, refilling my, my soda. Walk back out, look over. There's keys hanging out of the ATM machine. Part of what I ran also ran uh, lost and found for the VA. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, shit. And from a job that I briefly held that I mentioned once on one video... I used to change out some money out of an ATM machine. So I knew how, you know, this worked. But there was no way I was going to lose, you know, a very good paying job over $5,000. Because that's how much I usually just stock an ATM machine. And I locked that bitch up. I took the keys. I took it to the mail room. Because that's where, you know, we put our uh, our stuff away. That's the craziest thing I've ever seen happen at the VA. Other than that, the vets just put up with what they put up with. And it was sad, but. We know from a compilation of the information from the time he had that first communication with Justice that he was seeking out Amber who wanted to commit suicide, who was the victim of sex trafficking, and it was all a figment of his imagination. We've had the opportunity to interview the 11-year-old. Oh I can't baby. underscore enough her bravery. I can't underscore enough her ability to think through of how to survive when she has just witnessed her father, her baby brother, and her stepmother viciously murdered in her right before her very eyes. We interviewed her and she said, I was outside helping dad do yard work on a Saturday afternoon. He was mowing. I went in the house as he was having a conversation with a man outside. And dad told me later that it, he was looking for somebody by the name of Amber who, he, who this guy thought was gonna commit suicide. She said, I was asleep in my bed when dad woke me up and took me to the bathroom to hide me. And I was there when they killed my dad, my brother, and my stepmom. He then took me to the living room. I was trying to crouch down behind, beside a cabinet and the toilet. And that's when he called me Amber. And I told him, I'm not Amber. And he said, three, two, one, and he shot me. Oh and I held the wound. And he asked me about Amber again, and I told him, I, I don't know an Amber, and he shot me again in the hand. 
and he asked me where Amber was, and he shot me again. And then he told me, do you know why I killed your parents? It's because they're sex traffickers. She says, I played dead and I prayed. We know that she's had four surgeries so far. She's in intensive care. She was able to give us a good statement, but she didn't even recall all the additional gunshot wounds she received wow. at this initial interview. We know she has at least seven oh my God. bullet holes in her. You and once again, because of her medical care, we don't know if it's seven separate shots or if it's seven, if it's a total of seven like holes in and, and some of them may be in and out shots. Oh my God. She shot God. in the hand, in the leg. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. She shot in the hand, in the legs, in the thigh, and into the abdominal cavity. But she's alive. I've never seen him look this emotional. And how she survived that is truly a God thing. He thought he left her for dead, but she was way smarter than he was. And God truly was with that little girl that evening. You know, my editorial comment is, I know my God, my God is pissed. That's not the God we know. But he gave God all the reason for him doing this. God told me to do it. God told me to do it. Well, I'm kind of like his girlfriend. No, God didn't tell you to do that. But he did it and blamed it on God. That's what we know now. We're still at the crime scene. We're still interviewing people. We have found other witnesses that knew he was going to the hurricane recovery. No one yet has told us they knew anything about any violence. No one said that. The investigation's ongoing, as you well know, the investigation is not near over, but now we're going to witnesses and friends and doing dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and this is going to go on for weeks and weeks and weeks as we prepare a case against this mass murder, against this totally evil person. Totally e evil, evil, totally, totally, totally evil. You should see him now that he doesn't have his roids or his protein shakes and all that. They show him getting in and out of the car. All that muscle, turn to fat. There's not words to adequately describe the rage and the that we all feel about what he did to this innocent family who's simply sleeping in their home. Excuse me. And they happen to be the unfortunate ones that he passed by that afternoon where he saw the man and an 11-year-old girl. It could have been anybody's neighborhood that was out with their children that afternoon. These just happened to be the unfortunate people that he picked on. Now you kind of understand why I asked for a lot of people just to help a little bit. Because they, what is remaining, an, an entire family with the exception of this 11 year old child is wiped out. And there's funeral bills and doctor's bills and all kinds of collateral issues that have to be dealt with. The family's doing the best they can. We are working with them, with our crime victims folks. Mm -hmm. 
but they can use help. Are there any questions? You know, I usually cut it short of the questions, but uh, you can see why this one's hard to put up. It's probably the most emotional I've ever seen him get besides upset. Um, yeah. Not enjoyable videos to watch, that's for sure. But, um, hey. I hope you guys get something out of this. Whenever you see or suspect that one of your friends or somebody you might know is seeming like they need help, you know, don't ever be afraid to ask them, hey, is there something I can, you know, you want to get out, go do something? Do you want to, you know, need somebody to talk to? You know what's on your mind? And even if they sound like they're batshit crazy, because Lord knows that, you know, we've all had moments where we're just like, maybe not making the most sense in the world, but we've all had those moments. And sometimes we just need a talking to. And it would have been nice if somebody would have done that to him. So, hey, I hope... Uh, there's anything that you get out of this video is that you know prayer is a strong thing for those of you who are religious for those of you who are spiritual you know just send your best wishes towards that little girl and I don't know much about the trial other than uh, videotape of him getting getting in and out of the cop car looking pudgy and uh, just chubby I don't, I'm sure, oh, I mean, obviously he's, you know, in prison for the rest of his life. I know Florida is real big on the death penalty, so I'm sure he got it. I can't see no other reason why he wouldn't have got it, unless he just became a total chicken shit and didn't accept it. But nonetheless, um, yeah, uh, this is a video that I've had a hard time putting up, but I got it up. So, uh. Uh, take it as you will. Let me know your comments, your likes, your dislikes. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your evening. Sorry for the late uploads, guys. Uh, like I said, it was a crazy week last week. It wasn't even a crazy day today. I just had a lot of running around to do. And uh, yeah, got this up later than I really wanted to. So I uh, hope you guys have a wonderful night if you're you know getting ready to go to bed. If not, you're going to stay up for a little bit while longer. There's a couple other videos I want to upload, some that aren't as uh, sad as this, that's for sure. Uh, so until that time, I know others say it, and I've known it this whole time, but I'm still going to say it. Peace. <laughs>